We are at the Sungai Bulu Wetland Reserve, which is a mangrove area in the north of, uh, of Singapore. And then they're trying to grow more mangroves. So there's a very small mud flat. So there's not too much space for the mangroves to grow because if there's too much inundation time, then the mangroves can grow, the young mangroves. When the mangroves do make it and form forests like this, they play a crucial role. The trees form a natural barrier protecting coastlines from waves while their roots help prevent coastal erosion and trap sediments, reducing the impact of sea level rise. The mangrove forest itself is home to many different animals, but that's not all. Mangroves store 5 to 10 times more carbon than any other forest. So we're interested eventually in how these mangroves can contribute to the attenuation of waves and the protection of the land behind. Research leader Dr Edith Horseman has spent years studying mangroves and says dynamic coastal environments often affect mangrove seedling development. A low survival rate he and his Dutch team are investigating to better understand the tree's growth sensitivities. We need to figure out how sensitive these areas are to changes in bed elevations. So um, erosion of the bed, but also accretion, so the increase of the elevation of the bed. And we try to relate that to the uh, wave dynamics and the tidal flows to figure out how these hydrodynamic forces actually affect the dynamics of the bottom of the bed and how that then relates to the vegetation development. These specialised instruments will remain in the mangrove swamp, collecting data over the next 12 months. We'll be measuring velocities at about 15 centimetres away from these sensors. The higher the velocities near the bed, the more sediment transport you will see over time. And that then is important to find out whether the area is eroding or accreting. So we measure wave heights and we measure the bed level changes, because you can imagine if there's a lot of bed level change, either erosion or deposition of sediments, then the young plants can get buried or they can uproot and topple over if there's too much waves. So that's why we are also measuring waves and inundation time, because the roots of the young plants and the young plants itself, they, they need oxygen, of course, so they can't be too long for too long inundated. 12 centimeters. Yeah. Two leaves. Over three months, master's student Marijn Houdeland measured and observed the growth of these establishing mangroves. Once in two weeks I will uh, go back to the mangrove and uh, collect the data. And then I also have to count and measure vegetation again and how it relates to incoming waves and the tides. We are hoping to find out that over a longer period, let's say at least six months, how much the young seedlings grow and at what location they grow and at what locations they can't grow. We already know um, what period they need to establish, so to get their first roots in the ground. Um, but after that, we would like to know what's, what their longer term growth is and how that's influenced by waves and bed level changes. If we can find relations between the erosion of a mangrove forest and the survival of these young mangrove plants, we can, for example, look into conditions that cause this erosion because there's lots of efforts to actually plant mangrove trees all around the world but most of these planting actions usually have survival rates that are really quite low like 50 percent would even be high already so to increase the survival rate of those kind of actions as well it would really help to know better what conditions actually affect their survival. In the Southern Hemisphere, New Zealand's Firth of Thames is the second field location for the Mangrove Rescue Project. Here, they're also monitoring mangrove development in relation to wave dynamics and forest floor elevation changes. Unlike Singapore, this mangrove forest is dense and expanding, with a continuous supply of sediment build-up supporting mangrove growth. We're especially interested in this site in New Zealand because it is growing, it is prograding so rapidly. So there's a lot of dynamics going on. The elevation changes of the bed are really quite fast, especially in the front of the forest where we see tens of centimeters of elevation change over a decade. Back in the 1950s, there weren't any mangroves here. By now, the mangrove forest is a kilometer wide. This type of Aficenia marina mangrove, only found in New Zealand and parts of Australia, 
are more tolerant to change and are able to survive in the cooler climate. We see that these mangroves are a lot denser than what we typically see in the tropics. That's partly because these trees are a lot lower, so there's a lot more trees in a small area. Dr. Horseman says the insights gained from his ongoing research will highlight the longer term benefits of using nature based solutions for coastal protection and stability. So I think the research we're doing here and the projects that we are running in Sungai Bulo and in other uh, mangroves are really important because they tell us something about how mangroves can potentially contribute to the safety of the island, so how they can add to coastal protection. And that in the long term is really important because of course in the Netherlands we have got our dikes and our dunes, but there's many countries around the world, especially in the tropics, that don't have proper coastal protection yet. And they also don't have the means to actually build these dikes that we would build in the Netherlands. So for those countries it would be really relevant to know how they can uh, refer to um, those nature-based solutions like mangroves to actually create um, a safer coastal zone and a safer home for their people.